Welcome to the HerbWorks Podcast featuring Roger Drummer, the formulator at HerbWorks.com. An educator in the field of nutrition and Chinese herbalism, Roger has a unique ability to keep things simple by taking all the guesswork out of complicated health issues. HerbWorks is committed to helping you improve your health and enhance your life through herbs and common sense. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the HerbWorks Podcast. I'm Laura Shakti. And Roger Drummer. Hello. So what are we talking about today? The title of our talk is, Is Your Gut Making You Fat? Is my gut making me fat? Yes. You mean my intestines? Your because gut. if you're fat, you have a gut, people would say, you know, a beer belly or a pot belly. I know. Usually you think I have a gut because I'm fat, but it could be that your gut, your intestinal health is making you fat. So that's what we're going to go over today. So in that conversation, we're going to be talking about your microbiome, which is your intestinal bacteria. Well, I'm hoping that you're going to tell me that there's a, a magical slimming bacteria that um, is going to help your back, your gut and therefore make us all slimmer around the waist. Well, there actually is, which is, this whole topic just fascinates me. It's, you know, we're, we're not going to go real in depth because, I mean... It's a lot of medical terminology, but I'm going to give you the, the nuts and bolts about how it works, and you'll have enough inner understanding from this to really change everything about your internal health. All right. Well, let's start with the microbiome. This is making me think about, you know, an indoor terrarium, glassed-in place with plants that people can go in and get a tour with lizards and snakes and all kinds of things. Well, no, 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 it's not like that. But <laughs> wouldn't that be a is, microbiome? It's your internal environment, basically the the bacteria lining your intestines. It's made up of bacteria, yeast, viruses, all the things that are in your gut. And surprisingly, there's actually more bacteria living inside of you than there is human cells. The funniest thing I ever read on this was that. There's so much of it, and it controls so much of your health that doctors make the joke that they don't know if we're humans with bacteria inside of us or if we're bacteria having a human experience. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I just cry. They don't know oh. if we're bacteria having a human experience. Yeah. Maybe we're just the human that our bacteria <laughs> expressed. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much of it. But really, what fascinates me, because, you know, I, I, I'm just into health and all these aspects of it. I have been in this arena since 1980, you know, even before 1980. But the reality is, is that they're always talking about getting back to the root cause. And this may be one of the biggest root causes of everything that goes on, because it's simply the bacteria that generates everything that goes on in your body and even your brain. It makes vitamins. You know, we take vitamins, but there's certain vitamins that you have to have the bacteria to actually make it. And it makes it out of certain interaction with certain foods. It controls your metabolism. It can, you know, it can regulate your blood sugar and it produces brain chemicals. What produces brain chemicals? The bacteria in your gut. You know, most people don't realize that a lot of the most of the serotonin that you have comes from your digestion. It doesn't it's not made in your brain. I'm just digesting that for a moment. <laughs> so, I mean, we do think about chemicals in the brain being part of your hormonal system, being part of your glandular system. So is your are your intestines acting almost like a glandular system then? No, they're calling it a, a separate organ system. Huh. Yeah, so, wow, it's, it's just incredible. And the research in the last five years is just off the charts for, for looking at the microbiome and how it influences everything. And just about every condition can benefit from changing your internal environment. And, you know, we always just think of it as probiotics. You've got to take some lactose. Right. You've had a bacterial yeah. infection or you've taken antibiotics. And so, so you now you get take... some acidophilus. And, and that's basically the, the basic understanding everybody has. But right. it's so much more than that. That makes up such a small part of it. There's all this bacteria that has, you know, its own... Every bit of it has its own impact on your health, and having too much of one 
messes you up or too much of the other and it's a constant battle in between it you know everybody's familiar with candida that's been in the health field everybody's talked about candida for the last 30 years we know that sugar feeds it well maybe well, not tell our listeners what candida well, is it's candida a yeast infection is, yeah right? it's an overgrowth of a certain bacteria which comes back to gut health okay and usually that happens when you're missing some other bacteria so that's where probiotics really are effective in building up beneficial bacteria to outnumber the candida, then it controls it. But there's a lot of other bacteria involved in your gut, and we're going to be talking about those today, but we're going to kind of emphasize the ones that make you fat and the ones that make you skinny. I'm fascinated. So what is, what is making you fat in your gut, and how, do you, how did it get there, and how do you get rid of it? All right. Well, it comes down to a couple of different bacteria and like anything else in science it's hard to pronounce so here we go (laughs) the bacteria that's the slimming bacteria which is the bacteria we're supposed to have the most of right in our gut it's called bacteroidetes 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 maybe maybe that's why that is a slimming bacteria meaning what meaning that it's the predominant bacteria in your gut and that it um, processes calories in a way that it doesn't hold on to excess calories, and it processes your food in a different way from the one called Firmicutes, which is a hoarding bacteria. So, Are you saying that our metabolism, how we actually store fat, is affected or even... Regulated, regulated by the type of bacteria you have in your gut. That's that's that must be very new scientific understanding. I mean, uh, it is. In fact, if you're one of those people out there that just loves this stuff, like I do, there's a <laughs> there's a great book called The Autoimmune Fix by Tom O'Brien. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, that is a great book, and he teaches basically the microbiome to functional medicine doctors. So he's Mm -hmm. lectured all over the world. This is an incredible book that anybody can understand and get into, and that'll teach you about it. But basically, this slimming bacteria uh, tends to be weak in most people. In fact, the, the one that we don't like, the hoarding one, the one that makes you fat, the one that thinks you're starving and every calorie that you bring in your body it has to hold on to and store it for later use, right? Mm-hmm. They're for micutes. That bacteria is the predominant one in most people because of the type of food we eat. So what's really fascinating about this is that they'll tell you, oh, eat your vegetables because they're good for you. And now after 50 years of that, we realize, oh, wow, that's the type of food that feeds your good bacteria and will make you slim. It'll populate it, and if you don't eat it, you get a bunch of the firmicutes, which makes you fat. Wow. Right? So it's beyond. It goes beyond fiber. It goes beyond, you know, calories. It goes beyond all these things in the fact that you're actually feeding a system within you that's going to determine whether you're fat or slim. This is just such a new idea. Um. So this hoarding bacteria in your intestines. What affects an overgrowth or having a large population of that kind of bacteria, which then affects gaining more weight or holding on to Holding on to more weight. You know, what it comes down to is, is very similar to what we were learning back in the 90s about probiotics and, you know, antibiotics. We know antibiotics changes your internal environment as far as bacteria. Mm-hmm. Gets rid of the good bugs and all that. Well, it has an impact on getting rid of the good slimming bacteria, right? It affects everything. It affects right. everything. But so does drinking chlorinated water. So does chemically treated water. So hmm. do a lot of chemicals in the food supply, environmental toxins, even over-the-counter painkillers disrupt your good bacteria, and they feed into the firmicutes, which is the one that hoards calories. So if you're eating a fast food diet, drinking tap water, taking over-the-counter things, whether they're drugs or whether they're just chemicals and food or whatever it is, these over-the-counter medicines that we tend to quaff down like candy, all these things grow the hoarding bacteria as opposed to the slimming bacteria. 
So how do we change the microbiome to be one that is more optimum for not carrying excess weight? Well, what you want to do is that you want to basically switch to the diet that we've always talked about, right? We've always talked about eating vegetables with fiber intact. Turns out the the thing that the slimming bacteria loves is fiber that's inside of vegetables. In other words, that's part of the plant that you're consuming. And they've done tests, this is fascinating, where they've taken isolated fiber and just eaten it and it has no effect on this bacteria. Right. But once the bacteria is part of a plant, this plant tends to feed that bacteria. So all whole foods, especially vegetable fiber, tend to impact it really well. So, Mushrooms have a certain type of fiber in it that impacts it really well. Even herbs. You know, I've read, read a fascinating uh, thing in another book called The Grain Brain by Dr. Perlmutter. I don't know if you ever read any of his stuff. Great mm-hmm. stuff on microbiome and the, and the brain health and he's got an art part in there where he talks about how they've now know that certain herbs things like tea and chocolate and the polyphenols that are in a lot of different herbs and the chinese herbs themselves things like berberine and all these things that they know are good for mm. um, diabetes you know right. even ginseng they talked about well it tends to grow the type of bacteria feed the bacteria in your body that helps regulate blood sugar. So is it the herb doing it or the bacteria once it digests the herb that's regulating the blood right, sugar? Right, there's a, there's a relationship, so they there's just, a biotic your ba- relationship Your good somewhere. bacteria loves herbs. So what are yeah. some of the herbs that would do this that you have in some of your products? Well, green tea for one. And, and that's have, in what? It's in all my products, actually, oh, okay. except for it's not, it's not in the mushroom complex but it's in all the rest because it's part of the basic formula green tea is part of the basic herb formula of tianqi and inner peace but the mushroom complex because it's grown on a mycelium has a special type of fiber that actually feeds beneficial bacteria so it's a considered to be a prebiotic so it helps your body make probiotics and and beneficial bacteria so all those things really help and it, anything that has polyphenols in it, like, you know, even the raspberry that's in my drink feeds it because it has polyphenols. That isn't chocolate. Dark chocolate have a lot dark of polyphenols. Dark chocolate. Well, why can't you make me a dark chocolate drink? <laughs> well, there's dark chocolate and you just can't taste it because it's covering up the herb. <laughs> but the reality is, is that all these things that have polyphenols, which we know are really good for us, might be working because they're feeding certain bacteria. Turns out your good bacteria, your slimming ones, love polyphenols. Hmm. And so this fascinates me because I had a friend a year or two ago tell me that this lady that he had given all this product he had that had a bunch of polyphenols in it, she lost like 50 pounds. He couldn't figure out why. I didn't really know what to tell him because it wasn't a diet product. Mm -hmm. But maybe it just changed the internal environment that she had and that's what she needed to trigger weight loss hmm. fascinating yeah and how does this relate to um diets that include fermented foods well fermented foods uh obviously because they're they're considered a probiotic and they have vegetable fiber which is considered a prebiotic so the some of the best foods you could ever eat surprisingly you know, people run out and buy probiotics all the time, and you get these right. bottles that last a month, cost you 50 bucks. Uh, you can get more probiotics out of a tablespoon of fermented cabbage than a whole bottle of probiotics. Hence, listeners, the reason that our refrigerator is filled with sauerkraut. <laughs> Yes, I do have large containers of fermented cabbage in my refrigerator. And I do try to eat it every day. I probably sometimes go six, seven months having it every single day. And then I get a little on. Oh, maybe I take a week off. But, maybe you take a week off from your sauerkraut. But I like it. And, you know, I have this, this what trick because I know a lot of people out there hate sauerkraut. And surprisingly, though, a lot of the sauerkraut in the grocery stores is worthless. Because what do you it's mean worthless? Been cooked. It's what? It's been cooked. 
a lot of the sauerkraut you see on the shelf in a grocery store yeah. has been cooked and then canned or bottled. That's, there's nothing in it. Once you cook it, you kill all the bacteria. What's the point of eating it? So, so it needs you, to be actually pickled It raw. has to be live. And, you know, any health food store you go to, will it'll say on the label that it's live. You know, so, you know, I pick up mine because um, I'm a Costco shopper. <laughs> and I'm Costco also, should love this channel. I'm and I'm also you. a bargain shopper. I get this huge jar of Wildwood organic, um, you know, sauerkraut. It's just awesome. So that's that's my go-to thing. But see, I'm a little little um, eerie of the sour taste sometimes. So I actually mash up a half an avocado with my serving and mash it all together. And I love it. And you taught me to put, what was that? Um, cardamom and cardamom, caraway. Yeah. Uh, coriander. That's coriander what I, is really I put good on it as well. On yeah. It. So and that's really good. Some other foods, fermented foods that would help the gut bacteria would be kimchi. My father was mad about Korean kimchi. Kimchi is good. Any fermented food. Pickles. We'll, we'll do that. Pickles if they're fermented. Yeah. They okay. haven't been cooked. And so all these foods, and it's good to vary it a little bit because each one will have a slightly different bacteria. Mm. You know, so, uh, but those things feed your gut. And then when you add other vegetables with it, uh, in fact, I think I was reading in, in Tom's book, Tom O'Brien's book, Autoimmune Fix, if you empty a capsule of probiotics into your sauerkraut that you're eating, it's like a bomb. It's a, <laughs> it's Are like, we hoping? We, we're, okay, hold on here, Mr. Drummer. <laughs> it's a bomb in what way? Not a bomb on the way out, I hope. No, no, I mean, it's like it's like the just um it really primes the probiotics in that capsule I to see. work you know and uh, instead of by itself cuz sometimes probiotics just don't make it to where you want it to go I and see. this is the other thing about feeding the good and the bad bacteria cuz i i mentioned if you're eating fast food drinking chlorinated water over the counter drugs all that stuff right it kills or it, you know feeds the bad bacteria but one of the problems with all those things is that because there's no fiber in it, it all gets digested in your upper tract. So it never makes it down into your large intestine where you really want to populate things. And so that's another problem. Besides the fact that the food's dead, there's no nutrition <laughs> in it, it's practically worthless, right? Now it's not even making it down to the uh, part of your body that needs to feed the good bacteria. Right. Before it's digested and taken care of. So let's simplify this for a moment. We've looked at the fact that there's there's some things hiding out in your microbiome that are um, reacting in your body or uh, regulating how you store fat. We as a society don't need to store a whole lot of fat in this day and age uh, because generally we have food sources available to us. Also, storing fat more than what you need. Um, you know, we don't have periods of starvation generally as people might have in the past. Um, so, what can we do to really make that slimming bacteria work better besides what we've talked about, which is eating lots and lots of sauerkraut or other pickled well, things? Well, you don't have to eat a lot. You just have to have a serving per day. A serving per day. You All right, that's not too bad. You don't have to eat a bad. lot. There's, there's a trillion bacteria in one of those servings. Why? It's unbelievable. That's why it's more than a whole bottle of probiotics. But the reality is, is it's just what you do every day. You have to have uh, a little... Well, it's, it's optimal to have some fermented food every day, make it part of your diet. And then it's good to eat a lot of whole foods, a lot of vegetables that have fiber intact. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to drink filtered water that doesn't have chemicals in it that kill beneficial bacteria. Oh, uh, yeah. It's good to limit your amount of over-the-counter painkillers because more than likely you have some other imbalance that's causing you to have all that pain anyway. And you got to find out what it is. And so... By limiting all the things that we know are bad for it, basically cleaning up your diet that doesn't have chemicals in it. And I would say one of the big issues with it, in my opinion, is is eliminating all genetically modified food from your diet. So you're talking about genetically modified organisms, otherwise known as GMOs. Right. And you have to limit that because the very nature of that food uh, has chemicals in it and the pesticides they use along with it 
have been shown to disrupt your beneficial bacteria. And so we do know that glycophosphates, which is the main pesticide used on genetically modified food, um, has a cancer-causing effect. That's been proven. It's been in the news. Uh, But besides that, it kills beneficial bacteria. So it's causing inflammation throughout your whole body by disrupting the bacteria that have in your system. This is the thing about having too much of the firmicutes. That type of bacteria tends to lean toward inflammatory states. And so if you have inflammation in your system, it probably the best way to eliminate that is start attacking what you have wrong with your gut and then how that goes throughout your entire system. Now, one of the issues with GMO, and we could do a whole podcast just on GMOs, but um, I will say that these kind of foods tend to be in processed foods more often than not. They tend to be in cheaper foods more often than not. Like, you know, when people think, oh, I've got such a bargain because I got this cereal and this thing and that thing, and it's so cheap. But if you were to actually look at it, I mean, certainly it's not organic, It's also, now you're saying with the GMOs, possibly really harming your body. 80% of the food sold in America now has GMOs in it. So you have to buy organic or something that says it's labeled non-GMO. And, you know, the great thing about the organic food movement is that it's now everywhere and the cost has come down. Because it's not really, if you're a bargain shopper like I am you and you look around you aren't spending more money on organic vegetables. If you are, it's 10%. Mm. Who can't afford 10% more food, money spent on vegetables if you're actually um, not killing off your digestive system, if you're not consuming something that has cancer-causing chemicals in it? All these benefits far outweigh the 10% more you might be spending on produce. And so it's really, I buy it now, because of the lack of chemicals sprayed on it. Mm -hmm. And it's changed so much since the 80s when I started buying organic produce. Well, first of all, we didn't worry about GMOs. They probably were sneaking them in the system by then anyway, but they just (laughs) wasn't required to be labeled. No, you know, I've seen charts where they claim that from 30 years back when they started flooding the place with GMOs, all these different diseases that have to do with autoimmune conditions have increased by like 30%. It's unbelievable the amount of stuff that's happened since then. Now, you can't blame it all on that, but if it disrupts your digestive system, that's the root of everything. But but with organic foods, I remember when you bought them back in the 80s, you thought, I'm having a chemical-free food. I don't have to worry about pesticides. Nowadays, because the U.S. is so polluted, you're just hoping, hey, I'm only eating two pesticides today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not eating the 30 or the 25 somebody else is eating. You know, like a strawberry. You get a strawberry, that's just like a chem fest. A chem fest. <laughs> so now to a, to a bowl of chemicals. Well, GMOs also are an extremely political issue, yeah, because, you know, I grew up in Europe and GMOs are much, I, I think they're actually outlawed in most European countries. Well, they're being, pres- they're being pressured to sell them, but a lot of the crops are outlawed in Europe. And, right, but you know, here in America. Countries, I think Russia banned all GMOs. Huh. So does India. They're trying to get them all out of the country. Yeah, yeah but uh, here it's much more political because a lot of it has to do with growing ratio of the food, how much crop you can produce when you use pesticides that are in relation to those specific genetically modified Yeah, but all their organisms. excuses have been proven to be BS. Uh, they say they, they originally said we won't need as much pesticide. Now they need three times as much pesticide as they did before because all the weeds adapted to their pesticides, so they now they need more of it. It's just the whole thing is just a mess. And they found out that most of the scientists writing articles – talking about how great they are and how everybody else is nuts. We're all on the payroll of the company that made it. So Well, that's quite Basically, often. that's the problem with most science today is that it's paid for instead of just research. One of the things that really bugs me about the whole GMO thing is that wheat. You know, wheat we have a problem with because we're now finding gluten is one of the worst things for your 
beneficial bacteria. Right. You know, it damages the lining of your gut, makes you susceptible to, um, you know, autoimmune conditions. And that's pretty much a known science now, even though it's argued against because wheat is a huge industry, well, right? Well, yeah. So, but it's a fact. But the problem with it now is that the industries that promote GMOs and pesticides now have come up with this new thing about spraying the wheat crop with glycophosphate three weeks before harvest so that it dries out drier Mm -hmm. and makes it easier to harvest. Well, here's the problem with the spraying the wheat with glycophosphate. What they're basically doing is convincing farmers that by going through this process and spraying with some pesticides, instead of doing the other process that they used to do, which was let the sun dry it out when it dies, which is free. um, (laughs) Which is free, but takes time. They now convince most of them to just spray it with another pesticide. Now, that to me tells me that that industry does not care at all about anybody that's eating their product. Well, it's just the bottom dollar. And, and I can't understand how any scientist can think that adding an extra load of pesticides to your food before you get it is going to be good for everybody. So despite all these issues with GMOs, which are you know political and, and monetary and health, it sounds like the best way to, to have gut health is to eat organic food. It is, but also include a lot of vegetables and fruit because you can't just eat, you know, organic breads and organic sandwiches and organic things like that. It has to have a great amount of of your diet just being vegetables and fruit because mm-hmm. the pigments in all those foods tend to feed the good bacteria in your body. Hmm. So it's almost like we can be our own farmers of our own microbiome by simply what we eat. Basically, you are. You're tilling the soil just by eating right. You're changing the the soil and the internal environment of your own body, and you're having a huge influence on your health. You know, we years ago, I don't know how long ago, 10, 15 years ago, the United States government did the Human Genome Project, Project, right? And we thought we're going to come up with hundreds of thousands of genes. And it turned out we had 23,000 genes, which was about a third of the amount of genes that we find in a roundworm, right? So we're not as complex as roundworms when what? it comes to genes. Yeah. So fascinating, right? But they found out that the bacteria in your gut has its own DNA and genes. Oh, and it expresses your own its own genes and influences how you express your genes. And factors 100 to 150 times as many genes in your gut bacteria than there are in the human body. So <laughs> you can influence your genetic expression by changing the food that you eat. And by feeding your own internal bacteria. So you might just do it because you want to get slimmer, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you're going to get much healthier, avoid chronic disease, influence expressing all the good genes that you have, and really have a much healthier, energized life just by paying attention to your gut and feeding yourself what your body actually wants. So when you have happy, healthy bacteria in your gut, you're likely to feel better, happier, healthier? You are. You'll have more energy because you produce the chemicals that make neurotransmitters when you have the right bacteria. Um, You're less likely to develop something like leaky gut, which is a syndrome where you have all these inflammatory chemicals make it into your bloodstream. Mm. So you're protecting yourself against chronic disease, and you will be happier because of the fact that you're influencing your brain health. Mm -hmm. I think it was in the autoimmune fix I read that the brain sends one signal to the gut for every nine signals the gut sends back to your brain. Wow. You know how people say, you know, my intuition, I listen to my gut. Your Mm. gut's sending a lot more signals than your head. And so you got to start paying attention to it. Paying attention to your gut instinct. And you don't want to be paying attention to a leaky gut (laughs) (laughs) or a gut that has hoarding bacteria that just wants to hold on to food and make you fat. Now, some people have immune issues or gut issues because of 
some other for some other reason, such as they've had surgery. They more than likely it's because of a combination of their diet and the amount of maybe pharmaceuticals they took. Because every drug, whether it's over the counter or pharmaceutical, tends to destroy bacteria in your gut. It changes your intestinal flora. So you have to do something to balance that back out. I read the most fascinating thing. It was one of the most fascinating things I've ever read in one of Perlmutter's books. He's a, he's a neurologist, by the way, and he wrote The Grain Brain, and, and it, which is a really fascinating look into your microbiome. Mm -hmm. But in that book, he talked about a client whose child had developed Tourette's syndrome. Okay. Now, that's a pretty um, harsh syndrome to have. Right? Yeah. But his came after a long period of doing a lot of pharmaceutical drugs and antibiotics included in that for something else he had going on and developed it. So Perlmutter put him on a heavy probiotic um, regimen, but he had him put it into an enema that he, that he took inside his body and held as long as he could. And within a few weeks, he got rid of his Tourette's. That's mind-blowing. I'm, I'm stunned. I was stunned, too, but I believe it happened because Perlmutter is, is an amazing neurologist. And if you ever listen to him, you can tell he's, his intent's very clear. He's a very honest, precise guy who just wants to help people. And Might so you. <laughs> he was shocked, too. <laughs> I bet. But, but basically what it showed, though, was I personally don't think that if you were born with that syndrome, that doing that would get rid of it. This is my... But I think there's a lot of conditions like this kids that are just brought on by a reaction to other drugs that cause an extreme imbalance. And in that state of imbalance, he manifested what was diagnosed as Tourette's. So if it's caused by something like that, instead of being born with it genetically predisposed, then basically you can reverse that. And that's probably what happened. He changed his internal flora and his body corrected itself. But it's an amazing story. I just, But it shows you the possibilities if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty and start paying attention to your own self. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been a fascinating subject. Um, now I have visions of all kinds of interesting things in the gut instead of my jungle biome. But um, <laughs> I think it's a very similar concept, right? It is. It is. You're just farming your interior. Well, listeners, this has been another fabulous conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Roger Drummer. And Laura Shakti. And if you want more information, go to herbworks.com. Oh, 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 oh,